Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Manjeet Singh from Punjabi University, Patiala. Today, we are going to discuss about a module, Business and Comment, under the paper, Business Environment. Now, after completing this module, the students should be able to understand the concepts of business and government, to understand the basic prospects of business activity, to describe the present scenario of business in India, to understand the concept of synergy between government and the business, and lastly, to understand the process of disinvestment. We are in 21st century, and the outlook for the business appears to be a blend of high prospects for growth on one hand and serious concerns about the impact of business on society and the environment on the other. The apparent and the real contradictions can probably be the best reconciled by taking into account the expectations from the various stakeholders and harmonizing them. Prospects of business. The following is the illustration of the growth prospects for business. High GNP growth rates in the emerging locomotive economies of the 21st century, that is China, at the rate of 10% plus and India at the rate of 7% plus. This can be achieved because of the positive impact of the peace dividend on economies of USA, Russia, South Africa, the Middle East and elsewhere. Moreover, there is also a scope for high investment opportunities in infrastructure, power, telecom, roads, ports, railways, etc. This will require faster innovation and better products and services due to increased global competition. There is a tremendous scope for raising global trade, export sourcing and investment freedom. Now let us discuss about the present Indian scenario. People are among the most important resources of a country and for that matter of any organization and as such their efficiency or productivity is one of the prime significance and as it definitely affects their competitiveness. It is true that only because of this factor India is able to achieve its share in the international market though mainly in leather, garments, diamond and software. It is a human nature that whatever is available cheap is undervalued. So is too true with the labor which suffers from low productivity. Also because labor is inexpensive, businessmen have little incentive to push for higher productivity through greater investment in technology and human resources. Today, for any economy to grow, the benchmark is not the West, but the growing tigers of Asia like Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. So this gap between productivity is a worrying factor for us. Let us see the positive side of productivity. Higher productivity means increased output, which means more margin. Margins can be utilized mainly in expanding the facilities, which means more employment generation opportunities. Not to forget, higher margins can be invested back to upgrade the skills and knowledge of existing workers, so as to take the benefit of new production processes, which are also results into higher margins. On the other hand, Government is treating education as a non-merit component to, to the subsidies, which means less money will be invested in education. This factor is going to make the availability of skilled manpower difficult. So, in, on the one hand, there is scarcity of labor and on the other hand, employment figures are rising day by day. Synergy between the government and the business. India has adopted the planned structure of economic growth. Five-year plans were drawn up with the resources allocated to different sectors by the central planning authorities. 
It was a licensed, closed economy with the public sector holding the commanding heights. The private sector was in a nascent stage. It could enter into areas which were not reserved for public sector and a license was required for any project. Hence, for the first three decades of economic development in India, we didn't see much synergy between the government and the private sector. Economic liberalization began to an extent in 1980 and it accelerated in 1985 and achieved the takeoff stage in 1991. It is from 1981 onwards that we gradually begin to see synergy being practiced in the economic growth in India, the economic agenda being written in consultation with the private sector. The private sector retreated to make way in areas where the private sector had a competitive edge. A supreme synergistic approach is being followed since 1991 with the increased focus on globalization of the Indian economy. This synergy is now visible in virtually all fields of economic and commercial activities. Accelerative socio-economic development is indeed the common goal for both the government and the business. Agenda for synergy relationship is therefore one of finding innovative ways of working together towards a common goal. The immediate task ahead is to work towards the opportunities on hand. The economic liberalization process has indeed helped raise the growth rates in industry and economy. Urgent measures need to be initiated to sustain this tempo. Relationship between government and business. The relationship between government and the business can be understood from the following points. These points are related to agriculture, infrastructure, water transport, shipping companies, national waterways, air transport, telecom sector. Now let us talk about the relationship between government and the business. Firstly, we will talk about agriculture. Keeping in view the dominance of agriculture in the Indian economy and its tremendous employment potential, it should be given the status of industry while retaining the benefits available to it at present. The reforms should also focus on making far-reaching changes in the nature of land holding in rural areas so as to ensure that the benefits of liberalization process percolate down to the vast majority of people living in villages. Secondly, the system of price incentives should be mirror of market conditions. The resources presently devoted to farm subsidies should be better if they are spent on rural infrastructure development, particularly transport, storage and rural credit system. There is an urgent need to motivate the rural masses to undertake the noble schemes for rural development so, so that the reform process would have no relevance till the rural masses are made to be part and parcel of it. The policy implication should be given forge linkages of agriculture with allied activities such as horticulture, floriculture, sericulture and food processing. Infrastructure For attracting investment into the infrastructure sector, it is necessary to work for increasing the level of investors' confidence through transparent policies, procedures and legal framework. Disinvestment offers another opportunity. Hence again, the government will have to make up its mind early and clearly. One of the reasons for the delay in the flow of private sector investment is non-availability of projects cleared in all respects, for which competitive bids can be made. After the national highways, there is a plan under consideration of central road transport highways 
to create supranational highways. Through these supranational highways of about 14,000 kilometers length, there is a plan to link big seaports of the country with important cities. In the building of these highways, the role of private sector will be important. This will be done on the basis of bought scheme that is build, operate, transfer scheme by the private sector. The government of India has received 22 feasibility reports for the building of supranational highways estimated to the cost about 1,50,000 crores. Mm. Out of these, 10 proposals have come from multinational companies. Water transport. Under water transport, coastal transport and overseas transport have their own importance. In the coastal areas of the sea, navigation is comparatively cheaper. On the 7,516 km sea coast of India, there are 11 major and 148 minor operating ports providing congenial and favorable conditions for the development of domestic transport infrastructure. The development and management of major ports rests with the respective port trusts under central government and the state governments administer the minor ports. Among the major ports, Kandla, Mumbai, Majigaon, New Mangalore, Cochin, Johalal Nehru Port, Mumbai are situated on the western coast and Tutikoran, Chennai, Vishakhapatnam, Pradeep, Kolkata and Haldia ports are situated in the eastern coast. Johalal Nehru Port is the latest big port equipped with most modern facilities. The ports of Mumbai and Cochin are natural seaports, whereas the Kandla seaport is used in tides. Vishakhapatnam is the deepest port of India among the seaports of eastern coast. Chennai is the oldest seaport. Kolkata port is situated on the river bank. The 12th major port is under construction at the Euro near Chennai, which will become operative shortly. This port is being constructed with the financial aid of Asian Development Bank. Now, the, another aspect associated with this is the shipping companies. In India, there are 12 major and 187 non-major ports. A huge size of cargo, cargo traffic recorded as 1052 million metric tons in 2015 and that is expected to reach 1758 million metric tons in the year 2007. The ports in India and the shipping industry play an important role in increasing the growth and development of country trade, commerce and industry. India is 16th largest maritime country in the world with a coastline of about 7,517 kilometers. The Indian government has a significant contribution in supporting the port sector. It has allowed foreign direct investment of up to 100% under the automatic route for the ports and for the construction and maintenance of harbor projects. It has also facilitated a 10-year tax holiday to the enterprises that develop, maintain and operate ports, inland waterways and inland ports. National Waterways The Inland Waterways Authority of India was set up on 27th of October 1986. This statutory body is entrusted with the responsibility of development, maintenance and regulation of national waterways. The government has identified 10 important waterways for consideration to declare them as national waterways. The following have so far been declared as National Waterways Authority of India. The Ganga between Allahabad and Haldia on October 27, 1986. Then Sadia 
Dhubri stretch of river Brahmaputra on October 26, 1988. The Kolam Kotapuram stretch of West Coast Canal alongside Champakare Canal and Udyam Mandal Canal in Kerala with effect from February 1st, 1993. It is also proposed to consider the declaration of some more waterways like River Godavari, Sundrabans, and waterways in Goa. These national waterways are prepared by the Government of India in order to promote trade and business activities across the world. Air transport. For civil aviation, Air India, Indian Airlines, Vayudut, Pavanhans, and private air services are available. Air India and Indian Airlines were established under Air Corporation Act. Air India was established with the purpose of international air flights, whereas Indian Airlines for flights within the country. Air India extended its air services in five continents, but Air India reported a loss of 174 crores in 1998-99. This was despite 7 to 8 in percent increase in the operating revenue. Its main office is situated in Mumbai. For international flights, the aerodromes of Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, Chennai and Trivantaparam have been declared as international aerodromes. The responsibility of management and development of these aerodromes were entrusted to International Airports Authority of India. Telecom sector. A revenue sharing regime in place of existing fixed license fee introduced both basic and cellular service operators. Moreover, fourth cellular operator in all circles would be permitted. Additional basic service operators would also be allowed to give in the services. Licenses are to be issued to ISPs for setting up of submarine cable landing station for international gateways for internet. ISPs would be given approval for setting up of international gateways internet using satellite as a medium. National long distance service has been opened for unrestricted entry. Two categories of infrastructure providers, that is infrastructure providers category 2 to provide end-to-end -end bandwidth and infrastructure provider category 2 to provide dark fiber, right of way, towers, duct, space, etc. have been allowed. Termination of the monopoly of VSNL for the international long distance services has also been pre pawned to March 31st, 2002 and from March to 31st, 2004. There is a limited mobility in the fixed service providers in the form of wireless in local loop. Now we'll talk about disinvestment. The process of disinvestment is conditioned by numerous goals similar in the case with privatization. So trade-off becomes inevitable. There is still one important difference. The government renounces its control over public sector undertakings through privatization, while it may retain its control even after disinvestment. The government has to take decisions at least on three important issues while adopting the disinvestment process. These are, firstly, how much of the equity holding and of which public sector enterprises are to be disinvested. Secondly, to whom those equities are to be sold? And thirdly, what modes are to be adopted for disinvestment? Transparency. Trust and transparency from the basis of all constructive dialogues for a country to achieve accelerative growth, the people must trust the government and the government must trust the business, the consumer must trust the producers. But synergy relationship between the government and the business can flourish better on the foundation of trust built with transparency. Transparency is in disinvestment is important 
as it reduces the scope for collusion and misuse of inside information which would otherwise enable certain privileged sectors of the society to appropriate the gains from sale of equities held by the state. Transparency also helps the society at large evaluate as to whether the prices at which equities are sold really reflect the true worth of shares. Informatics The information collection system of the government should be standardized and streamlined. Information exchange cannot be managed cost effectively without adequate communication infrastructure. Both public and private sector units should work together in extending internet throughout the country. Cost of lease circuits for the data transactions must be brought down to affordable levels. Now we'll talk about the human resource and the core competence. Government and business will need to work shoulder to shoulder to remove the gaps in the area of human resource development. A more immediate requirement would be to create a healthy market for job training. Independent and autonomous organizations should be created to give recognition and to ensure the quality of training provided by various institutions. The government support, wherever necessary, is available, should be made available and should be quickly forthcoming for the new institutions to create the necessary training facilities in the emerging areas. The process of interaction between the business and the educational institutions should be qualitatively enhanced. In a knowledge-based development process, human resources became fundamental to productivity, the only sure step to growth. It is people who operate the machines and take decisions on allocating and utilizing all production resources within a company or country. The operational efficiency of all factors of production is essentially lined to the quality of manpower. Opportunities missed will severely limit growth. Decision-making process must be quick enough to intercept the opportunities. Needless to say, that logistics must not be only there but also be amenable for fast repositioning. Time costs money and money has also added cost over time. Organizational regeneration. Every phase of civilization and development creates different kinds of organization. The economic liberalization process certainly requires two kinds of organizations and organizational culture both in the government and business sectors. There must be a freedom for creating and disbanding organizations. It should be left to the organizations to decide what the future demands. Social responsibility and consumer interfacing. Environment protection is a major social responsibility for the government and the business. Both will have to work very closely to establish the links between the environmental health and the economic wealth. The biggest burden comes from the accumulated degradation of the environment on account of past investments which were made when the regulations were not even there. It would be better for the government and business to share the cost of rectification. Business will also need to take advanced action to bring in the necessary environmental technologies in time. The goal should be to move to ISO 14000 as early as possible. Small and medium enterprises should use collective efficiency mechanisms to find cost-effective solutions to the services environment-related problems that they face. Government should also extend a helping hand in this process. Labor management relations. In spite of labor costs in India being a fraction of the world's norm, and India 
having the second largest pool of technically trained manpower. India's claim to manpower strength is beginning to sound hollow when viewed in light of critical factors like productivity, quality, and competence. The largest word competitiveness report ranks India 39 amongst 48 countries in the overall competitiveness. Value added per worker in India's manufacturing sector is a tenth of that in Japan and fourth of that in Singapore. Abysmally low productivity levels, poor quality of goods as compared to international standards, high cost of production, comparatively high loss of man days on account of strikes and lockouts and rampant discipline may prove to be the factors that will choke the economic growth of India. The role of trade unions need to be reoriented from confrontation to cooperation and participation with the triangle of government, business, labor working in true spirit of partnership. Multiplicity of unions is another point of contention which needs to be addressed. Now let us try to summarize what we have learned from this lesson. Indian corporate sector is passing through a very challenging phase. Now in the present environment, globally India is being seen as a driver for the global growth. The quantum change and a paradigm shift in this turbulent world have revolutionized the way the business is being carried out. This decade has seen the globalization of business with the intense competition amongst local as well as international players. We have seen many of our sectors are competing with the international players neck to neck. We have move, moved away from the seller's market to customer driven market. The boundaries have practical disappear, practically disappeared. In fact, we are moving in an economy which is seamless. Even in India, the government has led to unshackle the business from the regulations and controls. We have initiated series of reforms which have reduced the regulations and the other government controls. Now all this has brought in the need for a total change in the mindset. Though we have done lot many things to revolutionize, revolutionize the business but still there are many areas where we need to work upon. While the whole gamut of corporate management needs a review and a hard look is needed at the utilization and effectiveness of the most critical resource that is the human resource. That is the only area where if we work seriously then only we can look forward to see India as a developed country in the near future.